Hello and welcome to Piano Shack with me, Woody. In today's video, I am going to show you how you can set the optimum volume levels for your uploads to YouTube or any other streaming music platform. I'm going to tell you why you should care, and you really should, and I'll show you some simple steps for ensuring that the volumes are at a good level before you upload to YouTube, Spotify, or any other streaming service. I've only recently discovered this myself and it's been a bit of a revelation and a real eye-opener. You need to know this stuff too. It's important to have a suitable volume or loudness in your videos or music. You see, if they are too quiet, they will not sound as good as other people's tracks because people do perceive louder as sounding better. But if you get it too loud, then YouTube or Spotify, many other streaming services will just turn down the volume of your music, track or video. That's a problem too, and I'll explain why in just a second. Let me show you how you can check if you're getting it right on YouTube. Okay, so here's how you check. Just right click on any video here in YouTube and select stats for nerds. And you want to look at this parameter here, volume normalized. It says here 100%, 62%. What that means is that my volume slider down here is at 100%, which it is, but YouTube has reduced the volume of this track to just 62%. It's reduced, it's effectively moved the volume slider down to 62% and reduced the loudness of the content by 4.1 dBs. That means that this video was uploaded too hot. The volume was too loud. We'll get to why that's a problem in just a second, but let me just show you now a video that was uploaded too quiet. Here's one of my own videos then that I uploaded about a year ago. Let's check what we have here, stats for nerds. Now, here you can see my volume is at 100%. YouTube has left the volume slider at 100% but it's saying my content loudness is minus 2.9, minus 3 dBs, less than their acceptable volume. YouTube will not actually turn up the volume of videos that are too quiet. So here I could have boosted the volume a bit to make it more competitive with other people's videos. Now that you know this little trick, if you're like me anyway, you might find yourself checking other people's uploads to see if they are getting their volume levels in the ballpark or not. This is called replay volume normalization. And the reason that YouTube and many other cloud streaming services do this is that so that their viewers and the listeners will not be annoyed by sudden changes in volume. So this is a really good thing. So you might be wondering, why is uploading too loud and having YouTube turn down the volume for you a bad thing? Well, the problem is that you probably need to over compress the dynamics of your audio to get a track that is louder than YouTube's acceptable norm. And this is completely unnecessary if YouTube is just going to turn it down again. So the result can be a squashed track lacking dynamics. And now it's being turned down anyway and it's just too quiet again. It's the worst of both worlds. Let's talk for a little bit about dynamics. And for more information on this topic, just Google for the term loudness wars or check out Ian Shepard, who is a mastering engineer who I hugely respect. He's somewhat of a guru and evangelist in this area. To get a louder volume on your audio, you can't just push up the master fader on your master bus or crank up the fader on your audio track. What will happen then is that the loud parts, the peaks and the transients of your track will go above zero dB, the absolute maximum. You'll end up getting digital clipping and nasty sounding distortion. And this will happen most likely before you achieve a reasonable loudness level. Therefore, we use dynamic range compressors and peak limiters to boost the volume. These work by reducing the loudest part of the audio, like snare drum hits, cymbals and vocal transients. You set the limiter to reduce the volume of everything over a certain threshold. By doing this, you get some extra headroom, and now you can increase the overall volume of the track without ugly clipping and distortion. 
This is a good thing, and I use a peak limiter in all of my tracks, and so should you. It's sometimes the only effect I use. Most often it's the only effect I use. The problem is, is that when you overuse it, you squash the dynamics. This is the difference between the quiet and the loud parts of your audio. And if you do it too much, it sucks the life out of the music. It just becomes a blob of static noise that's unnatural and fatiguing to listen to. If you push it too far, you'll add undesirable artifacts and distortion. The bottom line is that dynamic music sounds better. And this is why we need to avoid compressing our music too much to get high volumes, especially when it's unnecessary due to replay normalization kicking in. The loudness wars refers to the trend in the last couple of decades for more compressed and louder music, as you can see in this diagram here. This is a Michael Jackson track, and you can see how it was originally mastered, and then at the bottom there, how one of the more recent remasters looks like on the waveform. You can clearly see how the dynamics of the track have been compressed. Now we know then about YouTube's normalization algorithm and we know why it's important. Let's talk a little bit about how to ensure that the volume is correct in your videos before you upload them. So the trick to getting the right volume level is to use some kind of loudness meter. Let's discuss first the loudness levels then that are ideal for YouTube. This is one of many useful articles I have found on the subject. I'll leave a link to this in the description below. If we scroll down then, a couple of nice diagrams here which reinforce what I've just been telling you. There's an example of a waveform with nice dynamics. You can see that in the shape of the transients there relative to the main level of the track. And over here you can see an overly compressed waveform. So here is an example of what I've been talking about. This is the worst scenario when you've overly squashed your track and then the replay normalization has just turned it down anyway. So you end up with a squashed track that isn't even loud. There you see the green track, the original dynamic master and the squashed, compressed and then normalized version. Here's a table then showing the playback level of the various streaming services. We can see YouTube is at minus 13 LUFS, which means loudness units full scale. What does that mean? LKFS is a loudness standard designed to enable normalization of audio levels for delivery of broadcast TV and other video. LUFS is a synonym for LKFS. So you can use the terms interchangeably. We're not going to go into details here. There are many other videos and articles that do that for you. I'm just going to tell you the bare minimum that you need to know. A change in one loudness unit corresponds to one decibel change. And remember that zero is the highest possible level. So for example, minus nine would be five loudness units louder than minus 14. Let's talk about the tools that you can use to get the levels correct. You will need a peak limiter. I am using one by Waves here. This is their L2. I've also been using a completely free one called Loudmax for many years that's worked fantastic as well. There's very little difference between these, but I did pick up this Waves one in one of their sales. So let's use that today. You are also going to need a loudness meter, and today I'll show you three options for that, starting with the most complicated and the most expensive, which is this Waves WLM meter. I did buy this on sale actually for 29 bucks, so you don't need to shell out too much money, and there are free loudness meters available as well. So what we need to do here is adjust the threshold of our peak limiter to squash the track a little bit, raise the volume until we get the optimum loudness unit, which is minus 13. So I've put the threshold to zero dBs here, so it's not going to be doing very much at the beginning. But also another thing you should do is set your maximum output level on your limiter to minus one. You shouldn't use zero, and the reason for that is that there is a possibility for digital distortion and clipping when these cloud streaming services do transcoding of your audio track. Just put that to minus one and you're good to go. So let's play through this track. This is one I recorded ages ago using my DX7. And as you can see, if we play this now, we have quite a lot of headroom here. It seems to be peaking about minus six dBs. When you're recording your synthesizers, you should leave a lot of headroom here. But obviously this is gonna to be too quiet, so we need to turn up the volume. If you're tempted to do this on your fader here, Then don't, because you'll get this ugly distortion. 
Let's reset that. Reset these. You need to use your peak limiter. Let me show you that in action. All you need to do, pull down the threshold. The peak limiter will start to manage the transients, the louder part of the mix, and boost up everything else for you. So you can hear how it's getting louder now. without any clipping of our master bus, but now we've gone far too loud. Let's turn our attention to this loudness meter then. There are three measurements here. We're just gonna pay attention today to these three big readouts. There's the short term, which measures the loudness over a three second period. Then we have the long term, which will measure the loudness from when I press the reset button there, and then continuously onwards forever. And then we have an indication of the dynamic range in loudness units or decibels of your track in its entirety. So let's start making a measurement here. I'll reset the long-term measurement and let's just play through the audio here, see what we have. So we can already see that we are about minus 24 short term and long term, which is far too quiet. So let's start boosting up the threshold or lowering the threshold until we get to about minus 13 on the short term. That would seem to be about right. If I reset this now and we render the entire track, what's quite nice is that when we do this, this plugin will still be analyzing the audio. Reaper renders in a very fast time. Let's just bounce this one. It goes faster than real time and we will be able to check the total long-term measurement for the whole track. Watch this. So yeah, we apparently nailed it. We got our long-term measurement for the entire track to minus 13, and you can see we have a healthy waveform here. That's not too squashed, but you can see we are nudging up against the maximum there. One other thing to check when you are doing some limiting is that the gain reduction is not too excessive. A couple of dBs is okay. You don't want this to be on continuously. Let me demonstrate. If it's just clipping some of the transients there, that's fine, but you don't want gain reduction to be switched on all the time. I do acknowledge that for some music genres and styles, you would try and use a lot of compression and limiting as an artistic creative effect, and that's fine. But what we're talking about here is over compressing to get a louder volume. I uploaded a video to YouTube using the audio that we just rendered. I'll show you that in a minute. But let's talk first about two other options you can use for doing your loudness measurements. I would say though that this is a really nice plugin and I recommend it. It's been a huge time saver for me when trying to get consistent volume levels for my uploads. The next tool I want to show you is a simple VU meter. This one is also by Waves, but it was completely free. You need to calibrate it so that 0 dBs corresponds to 13 dBs of headroom, meaning that when the needle is hovering around here, around 0, we are at about minus 13 dBs RMS. A VU meter shows you the average volume of your track. So I've left the limiter at the same setting as we had before, minus 13 luffs, and you can see how the meters are hovering around 0. And that's another really nice way to ensure that your volume is correct. If it's too quiet, for example, you're gonna be down there. And you don't need to be exact here. Let's not get carried away or obsessed with this. If you're in the ballpark, then that's fine. Finally then, you can use the meter that's built into your DAW. Let me show you that now. You wanna have a nice big master meter. Let's play through the track one more time and take a look. So 
So this scale is a bit harder to read, but you want to be aiming for the RMS levels here again at about minus 13. Ignore the peak levels here, keep an eye on the RMS. This meter will show you both at the same time. We are about there, which is, yeah, minus 13, minus 14 somewhere, so that's okay as well. But I find this tool to be the hardest to use. When your content contains a mix of music and speech, then it can be a bit more tricky to get the levels right. What I do is use the tools I just demonstrated for you here to get the music at the exact right level. And then in my video editing software, I adjust the volume of the speech to get a good mix with the music. And that's worked out well for me. So this is the audio that we exported earlier from Reaper at minus 13 LUFS. Let's take a look at the stats. And you can see we were a little bit loud actually, but not enough to worry about. YouTube has turned down the volume slider to 95%, which is a reduction of 0.4 dBs. I'm not going to worry about that. We're in the ballpark and that's all that matters. We need to avoid being several dBs over or below. 1 dB plus or minus, nothing to worry about. I hope you found this interesting and informative. If so, please like the video and consider sharing this one to spread the word. Thank you very much for watching and subscribing. I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.